Good morning, Dog Nation. I'm Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented by Pella Window and Door of Georgia. What a show we have planned for you. What a Super Bowl we saw last night. How about them dogs, Georgia players, former dogs, uh, really factoring pretty heavily in the outcome of that game, including McCole Hartman, who has the game-winning score. We're all over that today. One of the things we love on a Monday after the Super Bowl is we bring in a former dog who himself was a part of a Super Bowl championship. So John Stinchcomb, great day to have him as a part of the program. We'll do some regular Georgia talk as well. Interesting statement being made by odds makers right now about their expectations for Georgia for the upcoming season. And you need to, we all need to, use this as the lens in which we view the upcoming season. And Alabama in hot water for Perhaps some dishonest behavior. We will finger wag and uh, and uh, certainly have a stern rebuke in their direction for what looks to be a pretty you know, pretty nefarious little thing here. We'll, we'll we'll talk more about that here coming up. We're just really glad to have you with us. It's gonna be a really fun show. It's Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented by Pella Window and Door of Georgia. And it begins right now. Today's episode of Dog Nation Daily is brought to you by Pella Window and Door of Georgia. Viewed to be the best. Presented by DogNation.com, this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. Here's your host, Brandon Adams. I was telling our video audience a couple of minutes ago, at least our first and 15 audience at DogNation.com, Dog Nation app. Monday after the Super Bowl, never the 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 most spry you probably feel. I come in today, a little, little uh, you know, little, little little scruff on the beard, didn't shave this morning. You know, kind of uh, trying to get as much sleep as you possibly could. A little bit of a late night last night. And I mean, the game didn't get over super late, but you know how it is. Super Bowl, a lot of people think the Monday after should be a holiday or they should move the Super Bowl so it coincides with a holiday like President's Day or something like that. Maybe one day that'll, that'll happen. Moving it to Saturday, that's even been talked about. Either way, though, a lot of Georgia fans, whether you maybe got a little less sleep than you sometimes get or not, you show up to work this morning feeling pretty good because the dogs factored very heavily in the outcome of this game last night as the Kansas City Chiefs win again. Now, we're going to do a lot of Super Bowl stuff on the show today. We're going to bring on a guy later on who won a Super Bowl, uh, a former dog. That's always a fun thing to do here on a Monday. We'll get to that here in a moment. I want to give McCole Hardman his just due. We'll do that here there as well. Can I do, though, uh, a little just sort of basic sports talk before we get there, though, because it's the kind of thing where everybody in the world was watching this last night, especially as it kind of got down to the – sort of pivotal moments, what started off being a little bit of a sloppy, ugly game, kind of turned into something that I think most of us will remember uh, probably for a very long time because we saw history really take shape. The one thing I told you last week was, you know what, I'm on San Francisco in the game. I feel like there's a little bit of a heat check against the Chiefs here, not quite ready to put Mahomes in the Tom Brady category. That sort of means that perhaps, you know, the idea he's going to win another Super Bowl and kind of lead the Chiefs to -to back-to-back. That seems like a little too much here. Kyle Shanahan, more on him in a moment, sort of feels like he's not the kind of coach as smart and you know savvy as he is to lose three times in the Super Bowl. That sort of feels like the wrong vibe here. It just sort of felt like a 49ers win. That's obviously not what happened. Wrong about that. And yet, I think you also now have to sort of make room in that category of all-time great quarterbacks. We saw Patrick Mahomes, if he wasn't in that category already, we saw him join that group there last night that – whether you're mostly a college football fan, mostly a Georgia football fan, almost everybody watching the Super Bowl. And what we saw last night was more than just a normal football game. It was kind of a historic moment in which Patrick Mahomes left whatever tier he was in to move to that kind of highest tier. This is one of the the legendary athletes of my lifetime now that he's led the Kansas City Chiefs to another Super Bowl. That is worth acknowledging. One more point about the game, just sort of generally speaking, and we'll kind of get into the Georgia part of all of this. Um, a lot of the people who watch us are also Falcons fans. Obviously, the Falcons are the NFL team from Georgia. Not all of you are. Some of you don't like the Falcons because you don't feel like the Falcons take enough Georgia players, but a lot of you are Falcons fans. Let me tell you one thing about last night's game that I think could be pretty good for Falcons fans here moving forward. Kind of a small thing, and it probably won't change to a great degree, but it's going to change some, and you may notice this. The most embarrassing moment in all of team sports, I believe, is the Falcons giving up a 28-3 Super Bowl lead. They have been mocked mercilessly for that ever since then and probably will be for the end of time. But 
Now that Kyle Shanahan has lost another Super Bowl as 49ers coach, and now that Shanahan is a part of another overtime Super Bowl loss, there have only been two. Shanahan's been a big factor on the losing side in both of those. Watch this and see if you don't see this play out just a little bit. Just notice this. Watch this. Some of the stuff related to 28-3 to is going to have to be owned by Kyle Shanahan a lot more moving forward. It used to be that was Atlanta's to own all by itself. And Shanahan, one of the reasons why a lot of Falcons fans don't like Shanahan is because he sort of bounces out and goes to San Francisco, and it seemed like he left the organization with that mess. Now moving forward, I believe that Shanahan's going to own a lot more of that. I think that's kind of an interesting kind of subplot to that, that I think now that Shanahan has failed in the Super Bowl again, his failure not running the ball with a lead as Falcons offensive coordinator way back then is going to become a little bit more a part of his resume, and he's going to have to sort of share the burden and the blame for that along with the Falcons organization overall. But now, to sort of zero in on the Georgia part of this, how great was it to see McColl Hardman get the game-winning touchdown in all this? And he's got really a very good personality. This is one of the reasons why, you know, this morning already, We've seen him on the Today Show. We've seen him on, I think, CNN, Good Morning America. He's sort of making the rounds. And even going back to his time as a Georgia Bulldog, prior to that as an Elbert County Bulldog, McColl's just always had a really fun, good personality. So not everybody likes the sort of morning cable TV or broadcast TV interview where you sort of leave the realm of sports. Now you become a little bit of a household name with people who don't spend a lot of time watching sports. Not everybody likes that. Not everybody handles that well. But in the case of McColl Hardman, I do think he sort of handles things like that really well. I think I think McColl is really good at that. In fact, I want to play a little bit of a, this is audio, not video, from the Today Show here this morning where McColl does a really good job of, of telling the story and also being very open and honest with the fact that the magnitude of catching the game-winning touchdown in the Super Bowl was almost a little bit too much for him to process in the moment. This is very human. This is very real, and I think it's great. Dog fans loved it for McColl last night. Here is how he told the story early this morning on the Today Show, courtesy of our friends at NBC. Hey, man, it feels great. Uh, that, that indescribable feeling. Um, yeah, that's all you really can say about it. It definitely feels great. Heard from Patrick Mahomes that you kind of blacked out. Is it coming back to you now? Do you really <laughs> not remember that key moment? I don't remember none of it. Like, literally, I when I caught the pass, I, I blacked out for a second. It's just like... I guess that the magnitude of the moment just like, like got to me. But all I can remember is after I caught it, I just seen Pat running to me like, you're a champion. I'm like, oh, we won. Okay, bet. And I started celebrating. So I definitely don't remember nothing after I caught the ball. That kind of stuff plays so well on NBC. Most of the people watching that show, not sports fans. They don't really know who McCole Hardman is. They just know he was the hero in the game that they were watching last night. When McCole tells that story that way, I just think that, I mean, that makes for him a lot of fans. And I think in the case of Hardman, that's really well-deserved. I'm so happy about seeing him get his moment. And, boy, what a career he's kind of put together here. It's a fun thing to be able to see. The other thought that I kind of have on my mind about McCole Hardman as it relates to that is, y'all, I don't know. His time at Georgia starts to feel like kind of a long time ago now, right? I mean, this is class of 2016 for UGA. Kind of amazing that we've been watching the Kirby Smart era now sort of play out that those – early days of the Kirby Smart era sort of feel like a little while ago now. McColl Hardman obviously a part of those. But when you think about McColl, what he's kind of become in the NFL, it's also important to remember something here. That he, as I said before, is a part of the class of 2016 for Smart. That was Smart's rookie class as a head coach. A guy who had never coached a game at that point in time, was doing double duty still as Alabama's defensive coordinator. And Hardman was a part of that first class that he put together. You can make a case, and I believe that I'm right about this. That's the best class that any rookie head coach has ever signed. In fact, it's gotten much harder to do that as a rookie head coach now. So we'll never see that feat matched. And I think prior to Kirby coming to Georgia 2015, turning into 2016, we had never seen anybody kind of be in the top ten like that, having never coached a game before, trying to do double duty. But he put a great class together. A lot of those guys didn't really kind of pan out the way you perhaps wanted them to. That's 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 true. But it was still the kind of class that sort of signified what Kirby Smart could be at Georgia, the kind of thing that other sort of recently new SEC coaches have really not been able to match, and therefore they haven't kind of gotten their career started because of that. Smart obviously did. So when you think about the the great moment from McColl last night, I know Georgia fans are enjoying that. 
you know, think about those early days. Try to go back pre-national championship. Try to go back pre-SEC championship that Georgia won in 2017, making the college football playoff. Go back to when, like, Kirby Smart was a head coach, or should I should say becoming a head coach for the first time. All of this sort of seems faded now because of how quickly Kirby kind of marched his way towards glory. But way back then, none of this was a guarantee. And there were some fans who were wondering, some media who were wondering, should Georgia really be replacing Mark Rick, a coach who's winning 10 games with regularity, with this guy whose only claim to fame is he you know, worked for Nick Saban and perhaps learned from him or you know, whatever else, has a, has, has a reputation for being a recruiter. And yet, in those very early days, Smart was showing you what he could be. McCole Hardman was a part of that. And for some reason, that was just sort of on my mind today. Speaking of 2016, something else was on my mind, and away from McCole here, you know, Malik Herring was also a part of this for the Kansas City Chiefs last night as well. And, look, Herring takes us back to not just, you know, very early days for Kirby Smart, but kind of very early days for Dog Nation when we as a website, as an entity, we're just sort of getting going. This is like in the, within the first year of Dog Nation Daily being on the air. And there was a really fun, we called it our Christmas commitments video. Jeff Sintel really worked hard to put this together. Jake Fromm, Richard LeCount, we'll talk to Jake about that this week almost for sure. They were kind of pitching in on this, and it was celebrating J.J. Holloman and Malik Herring, who committed to Georgia. And last night when you see Herring, you know, winning the Super Bowl, thinking back to where Herring started – as a recruit coming out of a great Mary Persons program there in central Georgia to where he is now, I don't know. I, I guess I'm just sort of prone to nostalgia. I'm probably a little bit of a dork when it comes to stuff like that because I get very sentimental very quick. But when you see you know, these guys, they're all grown up now and they're leading these sort of professional lives, I, I'm sorry. It is very easy for me. Maybe it's because I have a few years on me now. But uh, I, I do want to go back to kind of where it all began for some of these guys. This was a Dog Nation exclusive, uh, you know, Malik Herring getting ready to announce his commitment. Think about how young he was then and kind of where he is now as a member of the Kansas City Chiefs. If you're watching on video, you'll see it. If you're listening, you'll hear it. When I was a kid and I couldn't choose what I wanted for Christmas, I'd write a letter to Santa. I'd ask for a lot of stuff, and he knew just where to bring me. I need to figure out where I'm going to play college football. What's up, dude? What you doing? Writing a letter to Santa. Good luck, and let me know how it turns out. Thanks, Coach. Dear Santa, I've been good this year, except between the whistles. <laughs> I was a team leader. Mary Person is still alive in the playoffs, and we're having a great season. I want you to help me out with my commitment. Here's what I'm looking for. I want to play for championships. I want to be a part of something greater than myself. I want to be on a great team. Hmm. <laughs> what else can I ask them for? I want to play with savages. That's it. I hope Santa remembers the part about savages. So, listen, this is back in that era when we were asking recruits to be actors. And, like, I, I actually feel like uh, Herring does a pretty good job of acting right there. But we don't do a lot of those sort of, like, dramatic, you know, reenactment recruiting videos quite as much anymore. But back then there was a lot of acting that was going on in these uh, commitment videos. I think Mac Malik Herring does a pretty good job with all of that. But in the midst of him sort of talking about what he wanted from his football career, you saw him type it out on the, if you're watching a video anyway, type it out on that little letter to Santa Claus, I want to play for championships. And then – Lo and behold, last night, and we'll show this to you, what an amazing moment on CBS at the conclusion of the game where, you know, Herring, who once said as a player getting ready to leave Mary Persons that he wanted to play for championships, there he is, hugging his mother right there on the football field. She's obviously, you know, overcome by emotion, as you would understand, and Herring himself obviously aware of that moment. I apologize to our radio podcast audience. You're not seeing this, but it's worth checking out to find it. If you want to click our video just for today, it's an amazing thing. And I'll tell you my, my, my thought about this just real quick. Obviously, the Super Bowl last night was in part about the fame that some football players create for themselves by playing this game. We just did a couple of minutes off the top on Patrick Mahomes, what he is. Obviously, the entire world, my eight-year-old daughter included, knows who Travis Kelsey is now. There is a certain aspect of the game that can produce a lot of fame. But that's not always the crux of what football is. To me, Malik Herring is a football story. Yes, he was a four-star defensive lineman. The commitment video we just showed you gave you an idea of the kind of attention he was getting coming out of high school. But you all know, many of you have been with us since these days. That's not really what Herring's Georgia career was. And I don't say that disparagingly. I'm just saying that he was a role player at Georgia fighting for his spot. And he left Georgia to go be a role player in the NFL fighting for his spot. 
but he's making a living playing this game. The 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 fighting that he's gotten used to being a part of to to be a, have a spot and 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 to have an opportunity. That's just sort of who he is as a football player. And last night he once again got to celebrate as a Super Bowl champion. Like that to me is a really cool football story. That for every Patrick Mahomes or Travis Kelsey or whatever else you know in terms of like household names, super famous type people, the actual game is played by football players who do it for very little fanfare, very little glory, but they make a living playing the game. And that, to me, I got to say, is kind of beautiful. And it's fun to go back and think about the video for, for Herring when it all started. And it's fun to go back and look at McCole Hardman, kind of where he was coming out of Bowman, uh, Georgia, and an Elbert County Bulldog playing there in the Granite Bowl. And last night he's playing at Legion Stadium in Las Vegas. It's just it's just an amazing success story of coming from perhaps sometimes humble roots and being on the biggest stage of all and just showing out in such a clutch way when it matters most. I just love this game. I obviously have great affection for a Georgia football, and I am so, so proud to see Georgia so well represented on what turned out to be a very memorable Super Bowl last night. My name's Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily. The daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. We're presented by Pella Window and Door of Georgia, and we are happy to have you with us no matter how you get to us today, live on video across all platforms at 10 a.m. We've been in the morning for a long time here, and we love to be there for those of you who are able to join us live. Of course, Radio Athens, Sports Radio 960, Ref, podcasts, wherever you find them, uh, including Post Show every day at theworldfamousdognation.com. Our good friend Kaylee Manziel is helping us with that. We certainly appreciate that. Scott Harris, by the way, on the video, reminding us that Charlie Warner was in there a lot last night for San Francisco, as was Chris Conley there as well. The NFC side of this had some dogs there too. So fun day to be talking about the Super Bowl and fun day to be talking about Georgia football. And we would not be able to do any of this. We'd just be sitting in the rain right now if it was not for our friends at Pella Window and Door of Georgia. They have been really, really loyal and proud partners of ours for a very long time, and I am so, so appreciative of that and the other thing i appreciate about pella is is that it is my job to tell the stories of the sponsors who are part of our program and it is so much easier for me to do that when i genuinely believe in the quality of what it is that i'm talking about in the case of pella windows and doors i have seen this for myself i've been to their experience center there in duluth i've talked to their pella experts the entire team there i know how devoted and dedicated they are into really creating an experience for you that's going to be unparalleled. And that's why it's so easy for me to sit here and talk about this on a regular basis because I know in a time like this when it's sort of windy and cold and kind of nasty, uh, you want that stuff to stay on the outside where it's supposed to be. And those, you know, really well-sealed and just sort of substantial product like the Pella windows and doors, that's what it's all about. Plus, they look better on the outside. That's great for your curb appeal. It's a great way to be a good neighbor. It's It's just a really good way to take the best possible care the thing that probably matters to you the most, both in terms of your financial investment, but also your emotional connection, and that is your home. And that is what Pella Window of Door of George is all about. So you can give them a call today, 678-638-1429. That's 678-638-1429. You can also uh, find them PellaofGA.com slash dognation. That's PellaofGA.com slash dognation. And take advantage of great savings right now between now and the end of the month, February 29th. You can get 10% off Pella projects and 0% APR for 36 months. Make sure you check out Pella, Window, and Door of Georgia today. Great to have them here today on Dog Nation Daily. All right, we've got John Stinchcomb here coming up in just a moment. Prior to that, I do want to go around the doghouse. And I want to step away for a moment from the Super Bowl and kind of focus in on something else because as we start to look ahead to the 2024 season, I think if you're a Georgia fan, and really any kind of college football fan, especially of a top SEC or maybe Big Ten team, but for like any college football fan, I do believe there is a need to kind of recalibrate expectations for what your team can do for this upcoming season. And in the case of Georgia, I would say that's especially true. Uh, FanDuel has put out, and I love this time of year when this stuff starts coming out for the very first time, FanDuel has put out, It's first round of, like, win totals for the upcoming season. And I want to show you these on the screen. We'll talk about some of the other SEC teams here in a moment. But it's the Georgia side of this I want to look at here right now. We'll show this on the screen. Uh, When you look at FanDuel here, you see Georgia sporting a lower win total than you're used to seeing them have. And 
We would say in terms of the talent that Georgia brings back, it is not dramatically different than what Georgia has been bringing back the last couple of years. But for Georgia, whose win total a year ago is 11.5, to see Georgia now be sitting at 10.5, that is not, as I said, a reflection of an odds maker like this, what they believe that Georgia kind of has returning. What it is is a reflection of the schedule they believe that Georgia's playing. and We know this by heart by now. It's a neutral side game against Clemson. It's a road game at Texas. It's a road game in Alabama. It's a road game at Ole Miss. All of you know those SEC teams thought to be the best in this conference. And it is therefore a Georgia team that is not expected to go undefeated. We haven't seen Georgia lose a regular season game since 2020, but the odds makers here are saying that it's far more likely than not that Georgia will lose a regular season game here this year with a season win total. This is your regular season games only, of course, but a season win total currently sitting at 10 and a half. Now, as we've told you, FanDuel's also got some odds up on these sort of big Georgia games. Georgia's a favorite individually in all of them, a two-touchdown favorite against Clemson, uh, a point-and-a-half favorite against Texas. They're three-and-a-half-point favorites against both Alabama and Ole Miss. But the thing about odds is, even though you're individually favored to win all those games, you are not collectively favored to win them all. And so the expectation here is that Georgia's going to lose a game at some point in time over the course of the regular season, at least one game. Ten and two probably still get you in the playoff. And I just think that, you know, that's a little bit of a different feeling for us who are Georgia fans, but it's also a little bit of a new era, I think, coming to college football. You know, you look at last night, Chiefs and 49ers. You know, there was, well, at one point in time, the, the Chiefs were, what, like nine and six here this year? You know, this is a team that stands on top of the professional football world, but they lost several times here this season. Both these teams, Niners and Chiefs, both took a pretty bad loss on Christmas Day, right? So as recently as a couple of months ago, you know, we're sort of looking at these teams not quite looking the part of a champion then, and yet it all changed, obviously in the case of the Chiefs, you know, January forward, where they marched their way to a Super Bowl. I think that college football is going to start feeling a lot more like that more frequently. We are kind of conditioned, especially those of us who sort of grew up through the 80s and 90s, that the idea of a college football national champion is something close to perfection. Lots of undefeated champions. In fact, that's kind of the expectation we have for a college football national champion, a team that's capable of going undefeated. If you went undefeated against a power schedule, even if you weren't quite playing the best overall teams, well, that must be, you know, the kind of thing that makes you deserving of a championship. We've just had a really strong correlation in our mind between college teams and undefeated records. But if you start looking a little deeper at some of these fan duel win totals, including Georgia sitting at 10.5, that is not the expectation anymore. So, How well will Georgia navigate this tough schedule, and what will the end-of-season record be? All of that is to be determined, but the expectation right now is more regular season losses for teams like Georgia and the other top championship contenders. A little bit of a new landscape around college football here right now. That is Around the Doghouse here today on Dog Nation Daily. When we get into our cruising around the SEC, courtesy of Royal Caribbean, a little later on, I'm going to look at some of those other numbers around the SEC because I do think there is some of that that is probably worth kind of diving into because there's kind of a glut of teams sort of around that sort of a a similar area, which could make for uh, some tough sifting uh, as you try to make sense of the SEC here this season. But all of that is coming up a uh, little bit later on. Uh, Jackson Ricketts also shouting out Robert Beal, who was also part of that for the 49ers last night. So as as we said before, a lot of Georgia representation in the Super Bowl. And speaking of Georgia representation in the Super Bowl, a guy who knows all about that, who once represented the dogs very well on his way to a Lombardi trophy and a Super Bowl ring. That is our buddy John Stinchcomb. So what do you say today? We keep this conversation going as we bring him on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Pella Window and Door of Georgia here today. From Athens and across the SEC or wherever the recruiting trail may lead, here's a DogNation.com insider. John, I said this before you joined us. I love having you on the Monday after the Super Bowl because I think you're the only person I have in my life who has a Super Bowl ring. I think that's true. Um, And you certainly have one of those. So your voice on stuff like this, obviously really important. I said a moment ago that I believe last night was more than just a football game. I do think it's the kind of thing that we ought to remember for a long time because I think it was Patrick Mahomes sort of leaving one category of player and kind of moving his way into that sort of revered, iconic, you know, you put him in the Joe Montana category, you put him in the Tom Brady category, whether he's not quite Brady's equal or not, 
he is in that tier. He lives in that neighborhood. I thought last night was a historic game because of the fact that Mahomes really left all doubt that this is one of the great special players we've seen, not just in pro football, perhaps in all of team sports in my lifetime. What did you think of last night's game? I thought it was their mark of a dynasty, right? You look at the Joe Montana's and Tom Brady's and what they were able to do, and they created the atmosphere that allowed for dynasties. I heard you talking about, you know, some of the earlier games, and uh, it's it's about ceilings. And for Kansas City, their ceiling was as high as anybody's. It, you know, there were some games along the way where they didn't play, um, you know, championship caliber of football. But when it mattered most. You know, they beat Baltimore, they beat San Francisco, they beat the two number one seeds in the bracket, and it's due to play by their superstars. I mean, Patrick Mahomes is one of those guys in this era that you're going to look back and say, I got to watch him play. And uh, that's fun to to kind of watch and be a part of. And last night was one of the you know quintessential moments for Patrick Mahomes where you're going, you can't count this team out. I know there's plenty of folks in this state that are aware of Kyle Shanahan's track record with a lead in in a Super Bowl. But uh, when you're playing against Patrick Mahomes and Tony Romo said it ad nauseum that you can't count him out. And that's because time and time again, he steps up in the moment and makes the plays that that count. How much fun is it to see McCole Hardman have the moment that he had a, you know, I was fairly unemotional about the game overall, but when McCole has the big catch, well, I'm you know, kind of jumping up into my seat or at least certainly leaning forward in my seat after something like that. I also think that McColl's got a great personality, and so if there's anyone sort of built to introduce himself on, like, Today's Show and, you know, CNN and all these places that a guy like that gets to go be on a Monday morning like this, McColl, I think, is just good at that kind of stuff. So how happy were you were for him to kind of represent UGA, represent Elbert County, just represent, you know, Georgia, the state, uh, the university, the way that he did with that game-winning touchdown catch last night? No, oh, yeah, Georgia was well represented, not only by McColl, but also Chris Conley. He looked throughout the game, and Georgia was making its mark known. You know, it's a weird stat that that I saw that Alabama has never scored a point. An Alabama a player that graduated or came out of the University of Alabama has never scored a point in a Super Bowl, and now Meikle adds his name to the likes of Terrell Davis and Heinz Ward and Fran Tarkenton and Sony Michelle. So. Uh, it was great to see a dog be the one to kind of cap the victory. Uh, like you, I didn't have a horse in the race, so I was able to sit back and hope for an entertaining game, and that's exactly what we got. What does it feel like to win a Super Bowl, John? You know, when you look at McColl and we showed Malik Herring, and they've obviously had experience with that before, but to me it just seems like such a different platform to play the game on. You know, for the most part – Players have helmets on. There's 11 guys in the field. You can kind of play the game with some anonymity, but it's sort of hard to have that on the Super Bowl because they're, I mean, last night it sort of felt like there were like 200 million people watching it, whatever the uh, the ratings end up being. It just sort of felt like the entire world was watching this at the end. And you played in a, you know, a, a close Super Bowl there as well, the kind of thing that people were talking about and debating the next morning. You guys had the uh, the onside kick, right? And, and some of the things, you know, f- you know, from that game there. You know, what does it feel like to go from being just a football player playing in a game to playing in the game that the whole world is talking about the next day? Yeah, I, you, I don't think you realize the impact that it's going to have. I mean, my brother played in a Super Bowl, and you know, I've heard him introduced a number of times, and somehow that gets left off the list. Mm-hmm. But yet every time I'm introduced, it's Super Bowl champion. So the fact that you know San Francisco is that close, that little margin of error is so small, but yet makes a huge difference. I mean, you look back and um, – uh, for all these guys, for Malik and, and for McColl, uh, having won a Super Bowl, it is, it is you know, I hate to make it bigger than it is, but it can be life-changing. The yeah. opportunities that you get uh, that come from it, the experiences that come from it um, are unlike any other. And, you know, it, it doesn't change your life. It won't save your life by any means, but it certainly will provide opportunities and platforms uh, that you never saw coming. And it's a special moment. I know last night they were able to celebrate. And for some, it was you know, familiar territory. I think uh, you know, there's plenty of representation on the Chiefs that were a part of not only last year, but a few years back. So 
they've been down that road, but there's some other guys where this is their first experience of it, and there's nothing quite as sweet as, as winning a Super Bowl. Uh, yeah, I mean, it reminds me of what you're saying of one of the great lines from John Madden back during his legendary broadcast career where he would say that the biggest gap in sports is the difference between being a Super Bowl winner and a Super Bowl loser. And, you know, as, you know, kind of seeing Atlanta kind of be in that spot and come up short a couple of times, it is true. It's such a hollow feeling to be the pro football runner-up. And it sort of seems like you ought to have bragging rights over – 30 other teams because there are 32 teams in the league. 30 of them couldn't get to the Super Bowl. You at least got there. And somehow it's not that. Somehow, you know, it is this thing of you got so close to tasting it and didn't get there that there is that thought of, as Madden said, the gap between winning and losing. I think we see this in college football too for teams that, that get to a national championship game or a college football playoff and don't win it, that, that there's just such a huge gap there as well. Thankfully, Georgia doesn't have to worry about that. But the gap between getting to the big game and then losing it is is really a chasm, isn't it? It's huge. And you think you can ask any resident of Buffalo, New York, for all those years where, you know, they became the runner up perennially. And what an amazing accomplishment. But nobody really recognizes the accomplishment. They recognize the fact that they fell short year after year. And, you know, it's the brutality and reality of sports. It's you know, we like to laud the champions, not those that got really close. And for San Francisco, you can't get any closer. I mean, you had a lead the entire game. You take it to the playoffs. You have a lead there. And yet it's going to be a storyline of Kansas City and their continuation and building of a dynasty. So it is a huge chasm. And, you know, John Madden's the one who, who he knows it best because he got to see it from every level as a as a player and a coach and announcer so um you know they, they know guys know that have been around the game for as long as as many have that that's a big difference between playing in a super bowl and winning one john before we get back to our questions i need to correct myself on something i'm being called out by our video audience rightly so earlier i said that uh, mccall harman played for the elbert county bulldogs mccall harman played for the elbert county blue devils not the bulldogs elbert county the blue devils <laughs> I want to appreciate no boost on YouTube for reminding us of that. Very important clarification there. I apologize to those who like to congregate the Granite Bowl on Friday nights for uh, not getting that nickname uh, correct. So, John, every now and then you got to let people sort of call you out for the error of your ways. I certainly deserved that for that. Well, I like the fact that you can get it cleaned up and we can honor Elbert County the way it's supposed to and their Blue Devils and uh, their claim to fame because – you know, that matters for a lot of folks. It sure uh, does. I've been mistaken for b- having played for Brookwood. And oh, no. That's as good. a Parkview Panther, I mean, that's almost like a, a cuss word around our house. Yeah, so you, don't, you I can understand it. You definitely don't want that. Let me uh, shift gears back to what I was talking about just before you joined us, which is some of those season win totals starting to come out. I love this time of year. I love projections. I love anything that sort of sets us up for a fun college football conversation. We see the Georgia win total. This is regular season only. Right now, sitting at 10 and a half, that's a game lower than it was a year ago where Georgia was at 11 and a half. And Georgia, the last couple of years, last few years, has sort of commonly been projected around that 11, 11 and a half, you know, type mark. Essentially, you know, the idea if it's like undefeated or perhaps one loss, and that's kind of the, the only sort of expectation. But when you kind of move that down to 10 and a half and realizing that pretty much everybody's about a game lower right now than it would have been a year ago, to me, that's a reflection of the anticipation of the top teams in college football all playing tougher schedules. Not everybody necessarily. I would say that Ohio State's, Ohio State's schedule not is quite as tough as some of the others. And I would say then in the SEC, LSU, a little bit of a break. But most of the teams are playing tougher schedules. And for Georgia fans, this is, I believe, John, a little bit of a recalibration. When you see projected win totals lower than they were a year ago with the talent level not dramatically worse than it would have been a year ago, that leads you to believe that, oh, expectations are Georgia playing a tougher schedule and more likely to take losses because of it. Where does that land with you? Well, it's breaking news. Uh, college football is changing and evolving as we speak. So I think the years where you have the undefeated national champion uh, are going to become much more sparse. Uh, that's just the reality of the landscape that we play in. Now, the good news for fans is I think we're going to get more meaningful regular season games. The bad news is It's not going to be an undefeated Georgia perennially, uh, even though they're 
we're in the heyday of this era and can perennially one of the teams that's vying for a national championship. I think, uh, you know, the reason why the adage is any given Sunday and not any given Saturday is because there's been a great uh, parity. There's been a great gap between uh, teams and, and their capabilities uh, in college landscape. And, and that's kind of because of the change in, in regular season schedule, but also the expansion of college football playoffs, I think it's going to mirror much closer to what we see in, in the NFL, which more meaningful regular season games or better competition games, but there's also a little bit more margin of error. So, you know, a, a Kansas City team that loses six games out of the first 15 still has a chance to win a, a, a world championship, whereas a, a good high-level college team that lost twice in years past would have no chance at being a national champion at the end of the year. Uh, now we're going to see a little bit um, something similar to what we've seen in the NFL where, you know, we're looking at the highest ceiling, maybe not the most consistent teams throughout the season kind of percolating to the top by the college football playoff time. Yeah. A couple of thoughts on that. I mean, I mentioned this a moment ago that you look at a team like the chiefs, you know, and this happens in pro football all the time. There were lots of moments during the regular season in which I think we were most, those of us who were even paying any attention to the NFL were mostly resigned to, this doesn't really kind of feel like a Super Bowl team this year for the Chiefs. They may not quite be at that level. They didn't have a ton of playmakers showing up, making plays, and you know helping Mahomes out very much. It just sort of seemed like they were destined to to go home at some point in time in January. In fact, they've been underdogs a lot through this playoff run here. The point is, is they became good when it mattered. I think college football, John, is going to be a little bit more like that, where the eventual national champion, whether it's Georgia or somebody else, we may have more time during the regular season. We sort of think, well, this team doesn't look much like a championship team, but it's going to be about making sure you're playing your best football at the most important time. This may be one of those ways, in other words, that college football does start to resemble the NFL a little bit more. It's about being hot and about being kind of well-constructed for the stretch run at the end of the year and not necessarily about being dominant week to week the way that you know some championship teams have been in the past. Yeah, and I think for Georgia fans, we're not going to cry over spilled milk here, but if you give last year's Georgia team a chance to play in the in the playoffs, I don't think there's a team that uh, would feel real excited about going up against the dogs, Alabama included. So, you know, I think it gives you a little more space for, for you know, that slip up. Georgia probably played uh, not their best game against Alabama. We can all agree upon that, but if you get let them into the playoffs like they would be in any future year, then no team wants to face them. And I do think it's about getting hot at the right time and having the highest ceiling. And you look at Kansas City this year, and they didn't always have stellar performances. But uh, if you get hot and you play high-level football, which they were certainly capable of, at the right time, you end up as champs. And I think that's what we're going to look forward to in college football, there's a lot that you change and there's, you know, you're going to have to let go of some things. And, and the idea of an undefeated regular season as you know, a, a standard or a benchmark probably is a little bit less realistic moving forward, but being able to compete when you've lost one, two uh, big time games and still have a chance to be a champion is very much on the table now. So um, you, you got to take the good with the bad, and there's plenty of things changing about college football that we all are adapting to. So let me make one more small point about this. Here's the other thing that I think is going to show up in fans' lives in the future. I think that Georgia fans are going to need to get used to doing a lot more scoreboard watching. You know, we have had formats similar to the SECs in both the Big 12 and the Pac-12 last couple of years in terms of how you make those conference championship games. It's not divisions. It's the teams with the best record. And I can tell you, as someone who loves college football and follows this closely, you can get pretty late in the year, the last couple of seasons, of both the Big 12 and the Pac-12, and have a number of scenarios out there for who's going to make the, the those conference title games and who needs help to get there. And if this happens, this happens. There are a lot. It's almost like trying to follow, once again, how you make the NFL playoffs. So there's just like nine different variables depending on how the results play out. That's not really been how the SEC has been because of the divisional play. You know, Georgia's had this thing wrapped up 
almost my early October, uh, you know, a couple of times where it's really clean, it's really straightforward. If you beat this team, this team, this team, you're just sort of going. Well, not only is Georgia kind of coming back to the pack maybe a little bit because of a tougher schedule, you know, you do have a handful of teams who kind of have similar projections to the point where you may have four or five different scenarios for who's playing in the SEC championship come November, and obviously you got to win your games. But Georgia may also get used to doing a little bit more scoreboard watching of maybe because you lost to so-and-so back on October the whatever, now you need a little bit of help, and that's just kind of the way that college football is going to be going forward. It's a small thing, but I do believe that Georgia fans need to be ready to not just root for their team to win, but getting used to doing a little bit more scoreboard watching than perhaps college football has required you to do in the past. Yeah, it, it, again, it's becoming more like the NFL model. And I think you, what you see out of the SEC and Big Ten is we're trying to create some of that separation already from the rest of the pack. We will see less games where there are dominant teams that you know walking in that it's not a matter of who's going to win. It's a matter of is it 35 or is it 40 points? Could it be 50 points, the, the score margin? Those, I think, are going to be fewer and far between. And like it or not, that's probably going to devastate some programs that get paid to play in those games. But it's also going to make for closer games. And like like you say, that translates to the back end of the season. You're looking across the board and say, hey, we need this team to lose. We need this team to win um, so that we can have a better chance for – postseason play and that's just the nature of the beast and the direction we're heading um so it's very similar to what we've seen in the nfl where you know it, those for them week 16 17 games for you know whether it's in your uh division or just across the conference those kind of things matter and uh the model is changing and obviously we're adapting with it as we go can I do one final topic with you before we let you go? And I always appreciate your time. I don't want to keep you long. But, and this is kind of away from Georgia a little bit. And I'll be totally honest, John. I'll be transparent. I love stirring the pot with Alabama fans and things like that. I, I like that kind of thing. I just, especially in the offseason, we don't have anything else to do. So you might as well just sort of pick a fight and kind of go back and forth with each other. But, like, I'm being genuine about this. I don't think it's a good situation that Ryan Grubb, who was hired to be Alabama's offensive coordinator, and is now going back to the Seattle Seahawks, it certainly seems timed to have taken place the announcement that he was going to be at Alabama OC, going to go be Seahawks offensive coordinator instead. It certainly seems timed to have limited opportunities for Alabama players based on their rights, 30-day transfer window after Nick Saban's retirement, to kind of make the best decision about themselves about where they wanted to be. They thought they were going to have one offensive coordinator, or they just thought they were going to have a offensive coordinator, and now Grubb's not going to be that guy. And I think we have this we can show real quickly here, John, before I give you a chance to respond. Uh, our friends over at the Next Round Live, which is a show similar to ours based out of Alabama, uh, they had a blurb from the Seattle Times about the fact that, according to how, how the Seattle folks are reporting this, the reason why the Seahawks delayed the announcement of Grubb's hiring there to be their next offensive coordinator was strictly because of the 30-day window for transfers that Alabama was trying to run the clock on that before they let the cat out of the bag that Grubb was going to be there. John, that just seems dirty to me. And that seemed, and I, I, I love the back-and-forth stuff with the fans, and I like kind of fanning the flames and that kind of stuff, but that doesn't mean I'm not being authentic with my opinion here right now. If, if this is true, the way that it's being reported, or the way that it just sort of appears to be, that is not a good look for Alabama. Do you agree with that? Yeah, it's the limitation of players, right? I mean, that's the why, how have we gotten here across college football? It's because we've seen coaches make these kinds of moves throughout the history of the game, and you're going, wait, that's not right by the players. And once again, you know, even in an era where it is very player friendly and there are opportunities, this just kind of reeks of what we've known in the past and what what players have been fighting against is you know at least give us an opportunity to put ourselves in the best place to succeed and that's a that's one of those things where you know, it's just not the case and yes it is dirty pool it is against the spirit of what's trying to be created of players finding the best situations for themselves and you know Alabama intentionally tried to create an atmosphere that 
didn't allow for player movement in an era where there is almost free player movement. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it's not a good look for Alabama. It certainly put their players in a compromised position where most other players understand where they stand and, and who they're going to be working with and working for. Um, so for the for Alabama to intentionally delay the announcement of grubs just so players' options are limited, uh, you understand the business side of it, but it's also just bad business. A, qu- a quick follow-up. Uh, we're obviously pre-spring practice, but this is sort of that kind of like skull session installation time of year beyond just the bad luck and perhaps the nefarious behavior of Bama in terms of how it's relating to its own players. How about the delay in terms of preparing the offensive philosophy you're going to use here this season? How much do you think Alabama's hurt on the field by having to go back to the drawing board for offensive coordinator here in what is sort of mid-February now, you know, pre-spring practice? But these are valuable moments in a college football calendar in that kind of first phase of the year. Do you think Alabama's harmed on the field by this right now? I think so, absolutely. I know plenty of coaches uh, that are in the NFL level that were a part of you know, first year staffs. And this is valuable time of looking at, you know, self scout. What do we want to do? How do we want to teach it? How do we want to install things? Um, It's an identity process and you you develop the identity before you lay it out and and present it. And if you don't even have uh, a foundation to build from, it's going to be a lot of scrambling down the road. Now, you know, what kind of compensates for that is that you've got really good players that can you know, make up for some of those missteps. But when you talk high level football, you're trying to minimize as many distractions and disruptions of, of what you're trying to do big picture wise and not having an offense and a philosophy and a, a coordinator, someone who's coordinating all those efforts of, hey, I want to I want to look at this. I want to figure out how other teams are attacking certain schemes and what schemes we want to use based on the personnel we have. These are all really valuable days that are behind the scenes and fans won't, won't really know until they see the impacts of them. They don't know, you know, the process that takes place during these days. They just assume that, you know, players are, are working out and getting stronger and bigger. Well, for a staff, they're talking about, You know, here are the guys that we have. What opportunities do we need? What did we do well in the past? What worked against all those questions so that they can put together a plan and an overarching philosophy and approach that they can then teach during spring ball and and reemphasize in training camp. There's going to be tweaks along the way. But you talk about approach, philosophy and identity. That's all being developed and cultivated right now behind the scenes with all these coaches and you don't have a coordinator in place you're going to really struggle to to get up to speed can be done a lot harder to do john i love our conversation i appreciate you joining us here on dog nation daily here today to kind of make sense of a really fun night in football last night and sort of what's next for georgia there too so we appreciate your time and we'll look forward to back having you back here again on dog nation daily presented by pella window and door of georgia very soon as well appreciate you ba go dogs yes sir Let's take a look around the rest of the league. This is SEC Through. Yeah, so really fascinating stuff. And John brings up, I think, an important point about the grub thing that I do think is serious and I do think needs to be discussed. Or at least he alludes to it and it kind of leads me to a point. We'll get to that here coming up in just a moment. Prior to that, though, let's go cruise around the SEC courtesy of Royal Caribbean. Now, a lot of you have heard me saying this lately about how much excitement and energy exists around Icon of the Seas and... I think that perhaps you might think I was prone to exaggeration or something like that. But the truth is, is I've never really seen a Royal Caribbean storyline be embraced the way that the debut of the largest cruise ship ever constructed, Icon of the Seas, has been uh, sort of discussed. I'll give you an example of this. So when we were on Icon a couple of weeks ago, they were nice enough to give us some swag. And one of those things was an Icon of the Seas water bottle. Uh, And so this is kind of a meandering story, but I'll get to the point. My daughter's been taking the water bottle to school. My daughter's eight years old. And one of her classmates, as my daughter tells me, said to her, I can't believe you got to go on Icon of the Seas. So even kids right now know what Icon of the Seas is. And how could you not when you think about all of the family fun offerings that Icon of the Seas is all about? You got the uh, Category 6 water park and the six different water slides they have on board the ship. 
You've got, you know, the fun of going to Perfect Day Coco Cay and all the family-friendly offerings there, the, the thrill side of the island and the, kind of the cool things related to that. It's a great time to be doing things when it comes to a Royal Caribbean cruise vacation and a great time to be taking one courtesy of our friends at Royal Caribbean and Jessica Slater, a travel agent specially selected for us by Royal Caribbean to help us with our cruise vacation needs. You can give her a call, 770-718-9147. That's 770-718-9147. Nobody knows more about Royal Caribbean than Jessica does. You can also email her, jslater at dreamvacations.com. And the time is now to get those final bookings in for our Dog Nation cruise coming up in April on board Allure of the Sea. Talked to somebody yesterday about to be on Allure of the Seas. So getting ready for a fun uh, trip there on that. It gets me excited about my own trip on Allure coming up. And what makes me so excited about that is the fact that I get to be on board with so many of you. Really looking forward to that. Can't wait for that. Jessica Slater, the one to turn to to get you help with all of that. All right, so let's go cruising around the SEC, courtesy of Royal Caribbean here right now. So we talked a moment ago, Ryan Grubb, Seattle Seahawks' new offensive coordinator, had been the Washington O.C., came with Kalen DeBoer to Alabama. There had been rumors from almost the word go that he was going to go back to Seattle and be the Seahawks. And the Seattle Times reporting just explicit, matter-of-fact language that the announcement was delayed. Yeah, there you see it. The next round shared this. So what the next round put out on Twitter was interesting details uh, about Ryan Gr- uh, Grubb and Scott Huff not joining the Alabama staff, including the closing of the 30-day transfer window. The Seattle Times writes it this way. Though the Seahawks had interest in Grubb from the start, listen to this now, one reason for waiting to make the hire official was to allow a 30-day window for Alabama players to enter the transfer portal to pass. That is as explicitly stated as it possibly can there by the Seattle Times, and that is not a good look for Alabama. Now, let me tell you why I think this matters beyond just the notion that Georgia fans kind of like giving a little bit of a side eye to Bama when they have a chance to do that. As John kind of pointed out, right now college football is in a fight for its future. And when you think about what the model of the sport's going to be moving forward, as I say before, the biggest question facing the sport is, Do you want to protect the idea of the collegiate sports model? Do you want to protect amateurism while also fairly compensating the players? Or do you want to tear down the model and try to build something different? There are some people who only use the the desire to pay players as cover for their actual true motivation is, which there are just some people who just want to tear down college sports. Some of those people want to do it because they like to tear stuff down. Other people want to do it because they think that college sports is so slimy and dirty and whatever else. They just have a negative opinion of college sports. Obviously, on this show, we don't have that opinion. We think college sports is one of the great, good institutions in all of America. But when coaches behave badly, when programs behave badly, it only gives more motivation to those who want to tear down college sports. It only makes them feel like morally justified in doing so. So if The way this played out is the way it's being described. Alabama players essentially held hostage by thinking they had Ryan Grubb as their OC, only to find out at the very end of their window, no, actually, that's not true. Then Alabama has, you know, behaved badly here. And it will be used by people who just want to tear down college sports. And they don't care what it looks like in the future. They just want to tear this down right now because they don't believe in the in in, in the coaches and the administrators and the people who you know, kind of run college athletics. They don't believe in those people. They don't believe them to be good and noble people. And when those, uh, uh, you know, figures behave in a dishonorable fashion, as the Alabama folks may have here, it only gives more cover to those who would just sort of light a match and watch the entire institution burn to the ground. That's what's wrong with what Alabama might have done. Now, Alabama and its offensive coordinator situation is not the only OC discussion taking place this weekend. What a strange story this is. Chip Kelly leaving UCLA as head coach to go be offensive coordinator at Ohio State. Now, this is a story that contains multitude. You know, on the one side of this, it certainly seemed like Kelly was not that happy at uh, UCLA. This also seems to be more validation. What we're seeing a lot of here right now. Coaches not currently happy with the current system. And you can't ignore this. You may not care, but you can't ignore it. That there is something going on here where a lot of coaches are saying, this is just not what I want anymore. And 
look, as I just mentioned, there are a lot of people who making things hard on coaches is the whole point of what they want to do. They don't like the hierarchy of coaches. They think it's tyrannical. They want to tear it down. And so if a guy like Chip Kelly, a well-paid coach, is so dissatisfied that he wants to quit coaching, to some people that's the point of the entire exercise. They want to make things as miserable on coaches as they can because they don't like the idea of coaches, whether it reminds them of their PE teacher used to pick on them or whatever else. They just don't like the idea of coaches. They want to tear down that hierarchy if they possibly can. And so when when someone like Chip Kelly leaves the coaching ranks to the eyes of some, this is the system functioning as it's supposed to, making things so hard that, you know, these you know coaches just give up and quit, which is what Chip Kelly may have very well done here. He'd be rumored to be in the mix for all kinds of things, ultimately to go be Ohio State offensive coordinator. This also makes UCLA's transition to the Big Ten look terrible. I mean, UCLA only got the ticket to the Big Ten because they came alongside USC. USC is what the Big Ten wanted. UCLA just comes along with them. And I just think it sort of speaks to the sort of non-serious way in which college football is treated out west. And USC is a part of this too, frankly. But college football is just not serious out there. The people that participate in college football are just not serious. If you can't keep your head coach as you move into the Big Ten from going to be an offensive coordinator for one of the teams in the league, then you're just not serious. You're not serious enough anyway. And so this, to me, I think is a huge you know, tarnishing on UCLA, the idea that they have any shot of being competitive in the Big Ten. Perhaps being competitive is not really the point. I don't know. But that's a really, really dark mark on, the, uh, on, on UCLA throughout all of this. And as far as the Ohio State part of this goes, as we've told you before, there has been a lot about Ohio State's offseason as it relates to this particular idea that has not made very much sense to us. You know, I'm going to repeat myself. The one thing Ryan Day can do is call plays. Like, Ryan Day is a an effective college football play caller. Successful developing players in the NFL, not always, especially quarterbacks. Uh, you know, creating the kind of physical and mental toughness that allows for a national championship to be won, so far, no creating the kinds of plays that can work uh, in most cases around college football. That's the one thing Day can really do. And yet this offseason, they have seemed hell-bent on bringing in someone else. You bring in Bill O'Brien. He also stays briefly. Now he's head coach of Boston College. Then you go in and bring Chip Kelly, who is clearly a credentialed coach, but I would say someone who has a history of doing things far different than what Ryan Day does. So is this what Ohio State's going to be now? Is this going to be the old Oregon offense and you're going to have Quinshawn Judkins and uh, Trevian Henderson and uh, Howard, the former Kansas State quarterback? Are they just going to be an option running style team and kind of getting away from the sort of NFL quarterback, NFL wide receiver brand that has seemingly served Ohio State so well? That part of this is really, really strange. I would also say, even though this feels like the kind of big, bold, win-now type move. I mentioned a moment ago, Ohio State's one of the championship contenders that would seem to have one of the more manageable schedules. So all of this seems to be done with a national championship in mind, motivated by the fact that Michigan just won this past season. But I'm not quite so sure the Chip Kelly thing works out the way that Ohio State fans want it to. First of all, Kelly's pretty strange. Uh, There's that. Second of all, this is not really a guy that has a history of handling pressure very well, and there's going to be a ton of pressure on him at Ohio State, even if he can kind of operate in anonymity because, you know, Ryan Day is the head coach. There are still going to be big expectations of the offense, and functioning really well with big expectations is just not something that Chip Kelly's done very well during his career. So This gets big headlines now. I don't quite know how well it's likely to work, uh, but we uh, will see. Uh, and then finally, we talked about this a little earlier, the over-unders from FanDuel for SEC teams for the regular season. Let me give you a few more of these here right now. I think we have this we can show. Can we show the FanDuel uh, graphic from earlier today? Georgia obviously sitting there at 10.5. You've got Alabama lower than it's been, I think, since 2016. They are at 9.5 right now. You've got Missouri also at 9.5 there as well. We'll probably end up talking a lot about this coming up uh, in, in the sort of weeks to come. Just kind of a glut of teams right there in sort of a similar category. The nine and a halfs are Bama, LSU, uh, Missouri, Ole Miss. A lot of teams kind of right there in that sort of similar category where a lot of things can happen. 
I think Auburn at seven and a half is pretty interesting because of the expectation that Hugh Freeze needs to do a little bit better this year. Florida's only at five and a half. Look at the schedule that Florida's playing. Do you see six wins in that Florida schedule here right now? Uh, they could be a pretty easy under, to be honest with you. Uh, Kentucky's at six and a half. A lot of people are going to love the over on that, even with the departure of Liam Cohen, because of what Kentucky has added in the transfer portal, not the least of which, a couple of big names from Georgia. Um, Texas, the other team joining Georgia at 10.5 here right now. So nothing but national championship aspirations for the Longhorns. Uh, when you think about the big games for Georgia this upcoming year, you know, it's, it's Texas that stands as the biggest. That's the team that was in the playoff. Georgia wasn't. That's the team that has the bigger expectations, higher than Alabama here right now. You know, for all the attention of the fact that Georgia and Alabama have not played very much in the regular season and this being Kalen DeBoer's first league game, it's really that Georgia game against Texas that's probably the marquee game for the entire league here this year. There's a lot to unpack with all of this. We've got more time to do that as the uh, days move on. Uh, but pretty interesting for right now. We'll make that cruising around the SEC, courtesy of Royal Caribbean. <laughs> And as we wrap up here today, let's do so with a golden shoe, obviously honoring the man of the hour, making his way around all the morning shows, but no more prestigious media opportunity coming McCall Hartman's way than being honored as a golden shoe. And not just any golden shoe, but a golden shoe put together at the hands of our buddy Ryan Walker here, who says congrats to a damn good dog, McCall Hartman, a.k.a. Clutch Dog, the pride of Elbert County, hashtag the Birdcage LLC. That's Ryan's uh, business there. And uh, you see uh, McCole Harmon, three Lombardis, Chiefs jersey. So he, so he has all three of the Chiefs Lombardis. That's kind of a nice, fun thing. Uh, three Super Bowl champs, great graphics celebrating him. Game-winning touchdown last night. Good stuff from Ryan Walker there on all of that. A lot of winning around UGA. None of that, though, around Florida. Lousy, stinking Gators, in fact, have not beaten Georgia in 1,192 days. That's our Gator hater updater. We'll see you tomorrow, Dog Nation Daily, presented by Pella, window and door of Georgia, and on video. Time now for the R.S. Andrews cool down. R.S. Andrews, when you turn to, for your air conditioning, heating, plumbing, electric needs, they show up on time. They do the work that's promised, the price is promised. They are all over that. All right, let's get your comments here. I happen to be on Facebook here right now, so I'm going to read right now from Facebook and some good stuff. Uh... Greg Childers and Oren Chile talking about the fact that right now there's still only about 10 programs you can successfully be a head coach. If you're not one of those programs, you're never going to win big. It kind of feels like that's the case. Now, there are a lot of people who hope that's not true because you did have a Washington breakthrough and make the playoff. You do have a little bit more parity in terms of where the elite recruits are going. There are certainly factions out there around college football who hope that it's not quite as like disparate as you just described for it to be. But last few years, that has certainly seemed to be the case. But Chip Kelly leaving a head coach to go be an offensive coordinator for a team in the same league, that feels like a different thing altogether, doesn't it? A little bit of a different thing altogether. Uh, let's see what else. Greg Childers, also in the subject of Missouri, whose season win total for next year also sits at 9.5 after having been in the top 10 this year. Greg says that Mizzou is tough. It wouldn't surprise me if they beat Bama. They are more physical. So there you go. Strong take from Greg on what Missouri can be here this year. Kent Holcomb wishing me a birthday. I appreciate that, Kent. Thank you very much. Do turn 47 today. You are right about that. Barry Watkins pointing out there could be a mass exodus from Bama players in the spring portal. Perhaps there will be, but as many of you are aware, they can't go to the SEC and play this year. So Alabama, through its you know maneuvering here, has successfully prevented other players, such as, say, Justice Haynes maybe, they have successfully prevented those other players from going to the SEC. And when you think about, you know, early enrollees and all the work that's being done this time of year and during spring practice, you know, it's not easy at any position to sort of bounce in the summer and go be, uh, you know, a sort of starter level player, a part of the game plan, big part of the story when all you've got is the summer. That's not quite easy to do given the importance on this portion of the calendar. So some Bama players may leave, but I don't know how many of them will be leaving to go be immediate impact players when they transfer to. None of those will be in the SEC because of the rules. That's kind of what Alabama's prevented here. Matt Rukavina predicting that one day Justice Haynes will be in a Georgia jersey. Perhaps that's the case. 
Orin Chile also shouting out a little birthday wish for me. I appreciate that. Thank you very much, Orin. Um, Matt Rukavina, after the dust up a couple of years ago, where Ed Orgeron talked about uh, UCLA sissy blue uh, uh, jerseys, that perhaps uh, Orgeron could be the next UCLA coach. That's kind of funny. Kind of funny. Uh, Ryan Walker talking about being back in the uh, golden shoe running. Ryan actually had a good one the other day, and I forgot about it. So some of y'all, if I don't give your golden shoe, uh, to be completely honest with you, it's not always because I found another one more worthy because we try to give out a lot of golden shoes. Sometimes I just forget. Y'all, I am not the most organized person on the planet. Berna Blackburn, thank you for the kind words. I appreciate that. Um, Bill Sanders says, why would you be surprised that a dirty program, he means Alabama, would do its own players dirty? Fair question, for sure. Fair question, for sure. Oh, uh, a- Avian Curry celebrating his birthday on the 19th. There you go. Avian, great month to have a birthday, for sure. Let's go over here to YouTube for a moment. Dina Pruitt also uh, wishing uh, me a happy birthday, saying that she's going to raise a peach-flavored uh, finished long drink, my honor. Dina, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. That's good stuff. Uh, uh, let's see what else. Uh, B.A. Scardigan says, so happy that Debo Samuel and Kyle Shanahan didn't get titles last night. So there you go from that. Um, uh, pretty good stuff there. Paul Moon hoping that Kamari Laster makes him the first round. Uh, I think his 40 will be his weakest combine trade at his length, but just watch him. He's a baller. Yeah, so what are the draft projections for Kamari right now? Um, I've seen some seconds for him. I feel like I've seen some firsts for him. That's a guy that I really want in the first round. I, I do. And if George is going to get three first-rounders, Kamari's got to be one, right? I mean, you've got Amarius and and Brock, who are obvious first for, uh, who are obvious first-rounders. If Georgia gets that third first-rounder, Laster's got to be it. I know there was some chatter about uh, McConkey, but to me, that does not feel like a first-round thing that's going to happen. But you need Kamari to get in there to have three first-rounders. Right now, this is also, you know, one of my favorite parts of our Dog Nation cruise. We always conclude with a huge draft party on that final night, so we'll get a chance to do that. That'll be really fun. Uh, let's see what else. Memphis Dog says, uh, B.A. and Eddie going to be partying for my birthday. That is indeed the case. Sadly, not much partying, though, in real life for my birthday. I'll be spending my birthday tonight, like, schlepping my son back and forth between baseball practices. Uh, that's pretty much the uh, extent of my birthday celebration here today. Um, B.A.'s Ty Stone Cold Style says, uh, does K.H. participate in Ohio State's NIL? So, I'm a little groggy post-Super Bowl. Who is KH? Um, uh, he says, did he buy downs also? We know he's actively going after high school students that UGA targets. So who am I missing on that? Uh, uh, am, I, am, I, am I missing something that? Um, William Perry asking me if, if I feel wiser for my birthday. No, William, unfortunately, I am still uh, as unwise as ever, unfortunately. Oh, yeah, Brady, uh, Pass Manager says bring your floaties for the baseball practice. Yeah, so these are both indoor practices. So, yeah, but you're right. Uh, it is rainy today. It is, a, it, is a, it is a mess for sure, Matt. You're right about that. Oh, 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 uh, Kirk Herbstreit. I'm sorry. Uh, I, see, I'm telling you, I, I'm, I'm not firing on all cylinders today. Um, you, I don't know if – so, you know, the funny thing is, is Kirk Herbstreit moved from Columbus to Nashville because uh, he was fighting with too many Ohio State fans. So – Ohio State fans don't exactly think of Kirk as one of their own, even though a lot of Georgia fans sort of think of him as very pro-Ohio State. That's not always the way that Ohio State fans do think of Herb Street. And like, my biggest issue with Herb Street is, like a lot of these guys, he just sort of lives in this world where he now expects to get no criticism whatsoever because, hey, don't you know I'm Kirk Herb Street? And, like, that's my biggest issue with Kirk is, you know, these people who think because you fly private jets and because – you know, the world sort of, you know, always bends in your direction. Therefore, you should be completely absolved from criticism. And if a fan criticizes you, it's some sort of felony because how dare the great unwashed mass, you know, have something to say about me. That's my issue with Herbstreet is, is, is that is that Herbstreet thinks the position he's gotten in life 
absolves him from any criticism whatsoever. And that's the stuff when we don't like the stuff we see from him in social media, it's always coming from that sort of elitist place. And I don't know that Curb Street is an elitist. I think that social media brings it the worst in people and perhaps it sort of dragged out that worst aspect of his personality. But um, we are not going to hold back at all. When we see people who use their, their position, their power, their authority as a way of making themselves better than the average fan, we're going to call that out over and over and over again. Let it be said. When, when people in the sort of corridors of power in college football feud with fans, we're going to try to be on the side of the fans because everybody races to be on the side of the fans. Even in this Herb Street deal, there's so many media types bending over backwards to sort of align themselves with the power. We are going to align ourselves with fans, and we have no, no problem standing alone in doing so. No problem. Um, Nature Gator mocking Mike White right now. Not the greatest of times for Georgia basketball. Admittedly, admittedly, uh, <laughs> Georgia basketball has gone from getting like big time hype on the show to getting mentioned uh, to cutting room floor. The loss at Arkansas not making its way into the broadcast here today. Uh, uh, yes, that is indeed the case. Um, Matt Brady also reminding us that the Alabama offensive line coach also on the move there too. So uh, that is certainly a noticeable thing there as well. Uh, good point. Spencer Clark says, Kirk Herbstreit's going to always be bitter uh, that the dogs beat them in the 93 Citrus Bowl. Maybe that's the case. I, I really don't know. Uh, maybe that's the case. Paul Moon says that Georgia basketball finally remembered it was Georgia basketball. Like, why is it so hard? Like, I mean, how is it so hard? Like, like I'm just sort of fascinated by that. Um, and you you know, I know that some people will say, you know, well, they got to spend an NIL. But you can't tell me that South Carolina is just sort of like dumping NIL all, all over the place for basketball. I mean, like they went from being, weren't they picked to be bottom in the league and now they're whatever their record is? Uh, I mean, like you can't tell me they, they bought their way to that team because I can't imagine there's a whole bunch of South Carolina boosters like, heck yeah, let's, let's pay a bunch of money to go be an eight seed in the NCAA basketball tournament. I, I can't imagine that's what's going on. But um, I don't know. That's tough stuff. Um, uh, Brady on, on the subject of not having a lot of talent. Yeah. I mean, I just don't – I mean, it seems like they're recruiting way better. And Asa Newell is like a star, right? So, I mean, maybe maybe that all feels different there. Plus, like, here's what I don't know. And I used to know so much about college basketball. I don't know anything anymore. Like, how many of these players are they expected to keep? Like, is Blue Kane coming back? Like, like how many of these guys will still be on this team next year? How many, how many do they want to come back? That's what I wish I knew. Like, sort of three-sentence summary of, okay, here are the guys that are currently playing that they're hoping to build off of with more experience next year. Here's who's coming in, and, and here's the expectation for next year. Because here's the deal. I have done the thing of, well, they're not very good yet, but, boy, there's excitement and hold on to that excitement and, you know, anticipate the future. Maybe that's still true, but next year you just got to be better than this. I mean, even with meager expectations, you still got to be a little bit better than this, don't you? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, the problem is it doesn't move the needle at all. So, I mean, any time we spend talking about it is, is putting our audience at risk. Uh, but, I mean, selfishly, I just like college basketball. I think, like, you see the atmosphere for, like, Auburn and uh, Alabama the other night, and then Auburn, I guess, goes on the road and loses at Florida. But this league creates a great atmosphere. Uh, I'd love, and Stegman Coliseum has been a great atmosphere at times this year. Georgia students are doing a good job there. Uh, teams just got to be better. Let's see what else. I haven't been to dogtaste.com yet. Let me do that. Then we're going to get off here in a little bit. Um, let's see what else. I honestly cannot tell what they're talking about at dognation.com. I'm, I'm seeing crushes and Gilligan's Island and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, South GA dog. That. I mean, my understanding is that's just true, is that 
Herb Street got tired of getting a lot of grief from Ohio State fans and just moved, I think they moved to Nashville to get away from it. Andrew Sisson says, I'm a bicentennial baby. Yeah, so I was born in 77, so I missed the bicentennial. But when I was a kid, I used to love those bicentennial quarters. I used to love those. BMAC asking about the cruise winner. Um, they have not told me that. We should probably announce that. But they have, So here's what you got to understand is that like, I want a firewall between me and anything that's drawing a winner for a contest. That's very important to me. I want to announce the winner, but I don't want to draw the winner. Um, uh, and so very, very important. Plus, you get all kinds of legal stuff and things like that. So I have not been told who won the cruise. I'll try to find out and give it to you because uh, several people have asked that. And, and, fair, and fair that they would. But much like in recruiting, and, I, and this pains me to say this, you've heard me say this before, if you don't know, it ain't you. Um, when it comes to recruit, if you don't know if he's coming to your school, it's not you. Well, much like the cruise, and I don't take pleasure in saying this, but if you don't know, it probably ain't you, unfortunately, on that. And I hate to say that. Um, let's see what else. Uh, DT also mentioning, you know, not only has Georgia had like a long 20-something year stretch of players being in the Super Bowl, how many programs have more Super Bowl MVPs than Georgia does? Or like, I don't know that Jake Scott was Super Bowl MVP, but uh, but like just a prominent member of the 72 Dolphins, you got the Heinz Ward stuff. Like Georgia is really well represented in the Super Bowl, right? I mean, maybe a lot of programs are, but Georgia had uh, – uh, Oh, third and Will says he would trust me to draw the name. Well, thank you, third. I appreciate that. Uh, like somebody made a graphic. I thought it was kind of nice. Like I think Oklahoma had the most former players in last night's game. Georgia had the second most. Like some of that's kind of random, I guess. But still, I mean, Georgia's like a, a big part of the Super Bowl every year. Um, let's see what else. Uh, Baruch Dog mentioned in the old days. So when I was a kid, and this is true. Now, to give you an idea of like what Georgia basketball has dealt with over the years. When I was a kid, Stegman Coliseum, which was it called Stegman Coliseum? They just called it the Coliseum back then. Either way, it had a stable next to it. So like it was used for like livestock conventions and things like that, which I'm not against livestock. But um, so, you know, the idea that it's, you know, I mean, that's that's the humble beginnings of Georgia basketball. They shared their venue with, like, cows. And the venue also had a stage as well. It's like your high school gym. There was a stage on the one end. So, uh, I mean, Georgia basketball does not come from, like, <laughs> some sort of, like, blue blood roots. I, I totally acknowledge that. They've renovated that thing a thousand times to not make it look so dark in there. And you still go in there. It's like a thousand midnights. <laughs> like, it's, like, it's like, how could a building be so dark? Uh, and they've, they've tried to brighten the place 8 million times. Now the facade on the outside with like the, with the glass and stuff, the, the concourse, that's beautiful. Uh, really a huge upgrade there. The inside, you know, kind of whatever, but, um, uh, and by the way, Jason Ricketts went to a rodeo at Stegman Coliseum. So there you go. Um, yeah, Brooke, Doug, I thought I was right about this. That Stegman Coliseum as a name didn't come until a little bit later on. Thank you, Brooke. I thought I was right about that. But the point is, it's like some of the issue with Georgia basketball is it did not come from much. I mean, the old story is, and some of y'all, I think, can confirm this maybe, is that one day, y'all know who Pistol Pete is, Pistol Pete Maravich. I realize we have, I mean, I'm not old enough to have seen Pistol Pete play. Anybody who's younger than me definitely is not. Um, but Pistol Pete was a legend, played at LSU. The old story was, and I don't know if this is true or not. I sort of don't want to know if it isn't true. But supposedly one day, Pistol Pete, and if you haven't seen like Pistol Pete, you need to go watch his like, you know, YouTube or whatever. He had some highlights. Died too young, I think. But um played for the Hawks. But anyway, the story goes that Pistol Pete had such a big game in Athens that the Georgia students rushed the floor and carried Pistol Pete off. The opposing player. So that gives you an idea of what, you know, Georgia basketball used to be. Um, uh, Paul Moon and Senior OG talking about a fast food place. 
I'll put that breakfast, fast food breakfast, up against anything. In fact, you know, one of the big conversations we always have around Dog Nation is, is like on these road trips, going to these games, like where we're stopping. And I've about decided that of all the places to stop for breakfast, that that particular place, not giving a free plug, but that particular place never disappoints, ever. It is just it is just an awesome. Now, part of it is also I used to eat that for breakfast growing up in Hall County. There was a few of those uh, back in the day. Uh, but that is a fast food breakfast that just absolutely slays the competition. Um, Frank Patterson, I did see that Brunswick's getting a Bucky's. That's awesome. Because, so, if you're going, see, I travel on 16 a lot. We go 16 towards the Georgia coast. So, if you're going 16, you know, towards Savannah, the Georgia coast, you miss the Bucky's in Fort Valley. Uh, or, you know, Warner Robins, whatever you want to call it. You miss that that Bucky's because 16 is right before you get there. And so, to, to give you, a like, a, you know, a sort of a Brunswick, Bucky's kind of right there on 95. That's going to be, I think that's going to be a game changer. I really do. Really do. Because I like, if you gave me the choice of trying to get to like Jacksonville, I'd much rather go 16 across the state than 75 down the state. I'd much rather do that. Um, but there's no Bucky's going that way, at least, you know, that far north. So the Bucky's in Brunswick is going to be a game changer. A game changer. Um, Foster Moss. I do like that, but that's not what I'm talking about. There's a different fast food that I believe is actually better than that. I do. For breakfast, anyway. There's a different fast food for breakfast. Your mention is my second favorite fast food breakfast. But the top, I'm just telling you right now, Christopher W. says the Bucky's brisket is awesome. And my son, he likes the brisket, like, burrito for breakfast. That sounds really good, actually. Um. Memphis Dog says the Bucky Beaver is richer than Elon Musk. Just about it, right? I mean, it's an interesting business concept because you know those places are so expensive to operate. They have a million employees. Um, the, I mean, the, it's a lot of land. If you look at the average Bucky's, it's a lot. And Bucky's is never going to sponsor us. I don't mind talking about them. Um, if you look at, like, it's a lot of land. Uh, so that's expensive. Ton of employees. The structure itself is really expensive. So, I mean, just a massive, massive investment, and yet it's it just a total game changer. Uh, Christopher W., the beaver nuggets, I kind of like those okay. I like those okay. You just get stuff all over your hands. When you're driving, trying to eat that, you know, just get that stuff all over your hands. Uh, Frank Patterson says a Texas alum would never allow Bucky's to sponsor BA. That's probably a good point. Uh, Christopher W. says the restrooms are immaculate as well. Yeah, very clean, but also big. A lot of them, you like that. Tripp says they pay the bathroom attendants $20 an hour. There you go. I love it. I love it. Good stuff. I just also like, I saw somebody make a point the other day, which is a good one. It's like, Bucky's is also just kind of, I don't know, it's just sort of, there's something like really kind of just sort of hearty and wholesome about it. I don't know. I like driving. I like road trips. You know, like there's a certain kind of like sort of fancy person that sort of, sort of flies everywhere. They'll never experience a Bucky's. They don't drive places. And I just think there's something really valuable about road trips. I just like road trips. If I wasn't a, a Dog Nation Daily host, I'd love to be a trucker. Just long haul trucker. Just going coast to coast. Now, I know you can't take a truck to Bucky's. I understand that. But just understand the point. I just feel really connected to like life when I'm on a road trip. And Bucky sort of brings that out. I think there's something to that. Um, Stick D's. I'm telling you right now, scroll back up. Uh, I forgot who mentioned it. Some of y'all need to understand, there is a fast food breakfast out there that I'd put above anything. Um, Let's see what else. Spencer Clark says, I stop at my first Bucky's in Missouri, so there you go. Um, Paul Moon, so the one up 75 is in Calhoun. you got to go a little past Kennesaw to Calhoun uh, to, to get to that one. And I've been to that one many times as well. Um, so it's one of those deals where, like, you know, you're kind of on fumes and you're trying to decide if you can make it. Uh, that's, that's always kind of the fun game of, like, 
Can I make it to Bucky's or do I have to stop before I get there? Um, yeah, see, DT on dognation.com, telling you right now, y'all are all mentioning fast food breakfasts that I all like. I, I like them all. Gosh knows I've eaten every one of them. But I'm telling you right now, DT is talking about the best fast food breakfast. Y'all go to dognation.com. You can find them. We're not giving it away for free. But uh, just, you know, sort of man-to-man here, I don't mind telling you the best that there is. Oh, yeah, Lee mentioning the softball team debuted here this week. And they have big expectations this year, right? The softball team thought to be really, really good, right? So there you go. Uh, okay, so this is – see, I, some of y'all are so much smarter than me. So Baruch Dog says that Stegman Coliseum was renamed after the original Stegman Hall was – uh, which were the student hoop courts were destroyed for new buildings in the Tate Center. So when I was a kid, we used to go to basketball camp at Georgia, and we played at Stegman Hall. So um, all it's like a big warehouse-looking thing, and it was like basketball courts. Like There were like eight or nine of them. And the, there were whistles blowing. all. If you go there for basketball camp, there were whistles blowing all the time. You had no idea what was going on. It was like the most overstimulating experience. I was just so nervous, not just because it's just, just like you could not tell what was happening. Just it was just noise, errant noise all over the place. But I actually played a good bit of basketball at Stegman Hall. It's like my memory of some of this kind of stuff. Y'all, y'all remember it as students, but I sort of remember it as you know being some of these places as a kid. Or we used to go to basketball camp there. We'd stay in Russell Hall. We'd play our basketball games at Stegman Stegman Hall. If you were if if you made the tournament and you advanced in the tournament, the final game was on the wooden floor in the Coliseum. And that was we I got to play a game there one time. That was a big deal to play the game on the wooden floor in the Coliseum. But I told you there was, used to be a stage. In front of the stage, there was a con, they took like duct tape and made a floor on like concrete. When I tell you that. Even as like an eighth grader, ninth grader, my knees would hurt so bad after running on that concrete. Like they wouldn't let anybody do that today for anything. Back then, they would make a floor on concrete. We'd play uh, on concrete floors uh, on the side of the Coliseum over there. Uh, Senior Dog 54 says, Is Andy Reid in the same offensive genius category as Bill Walsh, Air Coryell? Yeah, Senior Dog, I think so. I think you're right. I, I, think, that, I think that Andy Reid's one of the all time great coaches. I do. Um, I, I, in fact, I don't know how many guys have a better resume than his is because like the knock on him in Philadelphia was not able to get over the hump. But when you say, okay, in Kansas city, it's all these Super Bowl championships and in Philadelphia, it's a Super Bowl appearance. It's, you know, four NFC championship, you know, game appearances like that resume is unbelievable. And just in terms of the offensive innovation, uh, this is one of the great coaches of all time. It absolutely is. Um, Richard D's talking about how the Arkansas game kind of slipped away. Yeah, it seems like there's been a lot of that. And, you know, it's funny. It's like Bud Walton Arena is typically one of the toughest places to play in the whole league. You know, so it's not usually, you know, a huge apology required when you lose when you lose that one. But Arkansas also under Eric Musselman has just sort of fallen apart. So, um, there you go. All right, we are we are literally talking about everything today. Yeah, so Winford Stein Spring says there's a uh, Bucky's there in, in St. Augustine now, which I haven't been to. There's also one in Daytona, or is that the same one? There's one in Daytona and St. Augustine. That's kind of that's pretty close together for Bucky's. Um, but I haven't been to those. Uh, Jerry Popham uh, shouting at a different fast food breakfast. I had one of those the other day. It was okay. Um, it's not my favorite, though. Yeah, Craig Jones says it's in Daytona. I knew there was a Bucky's in Daytona. My family used to love Daytona. Um, Johnny Prescott on the subject of statues. Yeah, I'm very pro statue. I've never seen a statue that didn't have a right to exist. I saw the Kobe statue the other day that looked really cool. Um, yeah, so how much do statues cost, I wonder? If Georgia's not going to do statues, maybe you're onto something. Maybe these high schools would start doing their own statues for these players. We just go see them. That'd be kind of cool. Statues got to be pretty expensive. 
Yeah, Octavius Oliver says it's more towards Daytona. So there you go. Uh, James Crump says the Georgia men's basketball team is just an NIT team right now. Well, hell, that's not even guaranteed, is it? I mean, Georgia hasn't made a postseason tournament of any kind since 2017, I don't think. Are they are they guaranteed to make the NIT? Because I'm not even sure that's true now. Uh, all right. Um, Peter Wilson also pointing out that artificial turf has a concrete base also, yeah. Um, Greg Childers also talking a little softball in here. We love to see that. All right, we got to go. It's late. Oh, there you go. Fred Gunn giving you a good um, biscuit re- uh, recommendation there in Rossville, Georgia. I love nothing more. So I grew up in Hall County. We have a lot of those like local places that just have like, the best biscuits you'll ever have. I'd love nothing more than just to have them all. All throughout like small town Georgia, that's just the best stuff, right? You go in there and everybody's talking about politics and all that kind of stuff. It's just just a great experience. Just a great, great experience. Um, let's see what else. Uh, there you go. Uh, all right, anything else? I think we're going to go. Good stuff. Uh, Randy Hall pointing out there's a Bucky's coming to Anderson, South Carolina in 2025. So there you go. Something else for the Clemson people to ruin. Uh, so all of that really, really good. Hey, y'all check out RS Andrews online, rsandrews.com, for your air conditioning, heating, plumbing, electric needs. They show up on time. They do the work that's promised. The price is promised. They are all about that, including. I'm told we have more cold weather coming. I believe that's true. So RS Andrews got you covered there on that. They'll get your heating system tuned back up to factory fresh specs. You can find them online at rsandrews.com. Y'all have a great day. We'll come back here tomorrow and uh, do plenty more Georgia football talk with you. We'll see you then. Dog Nation Daily, presented by Palo Window and Door of Georgia. See you then, everybody.